Alrighty, so uh, we're going to continue, um, and, and today we're on the sixth commandment, and it is that you shall not murder. And uh, although, right, I, I think there's a commandment that a lot of us are like, yeah, that's obvious, you shall not murder. But there is so much that goes into this commandment. Um, so we're going to dive into that today. And there, there, just so you know, there has been some confusion in the past with this commandment um, because, of a, uh, because of different translations. And it has caused people to, I guess, view this commandment differently and some of the implications of this commandment. And if you uh, look at a translation like the King James Version, instead of you shall not murder, it'll say you shall not kill. And although that is an appropriate translation, it doesn't completely uh, grasp the nuance of the Hebrew word. So when we look at the Hebrew word, it is rasa, which means murder, slay. But this part is really important with premeditation, right? So the word that is used here in the Hebrew is to kill with premeditation. That means to kill uh, whenever, whenever someone kills another person. It is a planned and an intentional killing. It is not accidental, but it is planned and intentional. And I want to show you an example that just shows the, um, I guess, the, the, the severity of, of, of uh, this type of killing, the, the, the type of, of violence that is seen in Hosea chapter 4, verse 2. And it says this, there is swearing, deception, murder, right? It's that word. And it says stealing and adultery. And then it says they employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed, right? So when we think of murder, when we, when we try to define murder, I want you to keep this in mind, that it is the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. And there's a definition from Got Questions. I think they uh, define that very well. So it is the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. And I think a lot of us understand that. But now the question is, why is murder wrong? Right? I think a lot of us understand that murder is wrong. We know what it is. But can we understand why it is wrong? And the obvious answer is, of course, because God said so. But he provides an answer or reasoning to why it's wrong. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, it says, Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. And then it says, for in the image of God, he made man. So the reason why murder is wrong is the Imago Dei, that we were created in the image of God. And if you're completely unfamiliar with, uh, with this, this is found in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, right? Whenever God um, created everything, the very last thing he created was human beings, right? It, it, it was Adam. And when he created, right, Adam and Eve, it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And then it says male and female, he created them. Right? So here we see that God highly values um, the life of human beings. Why? Because he created us in his image. We are the only creation created in the image of God. We are highly valued. So whenever someone takes away another person's life, what they are doing, beautifully said by John MacArthur, they take the life of a fellow human, uh, to take the life of a, a fellow human being is to assault the sacredness of the image of God, right? It is an offense to God. Only God has the ability to give life and to take away life. Not a human being. It is God's power and responsibility to give and to take. And whenever murder happens, what's happening is an assault, an offense to the sacredness of the Imago Dei. And what we see shortly after God created man and woman is the effect of the fall. Adam sinned. Sin entered the world, and we see the fruits of 
the depravity of man into play. Shortly after, we see the first account of murder, and it's by the very son of Adam and Eve, right? When Cain kills Abel. It doesn't take long for human beings to start to murder one another. If you read later in this chapter, in Genesis chapter 4, you will see that there is a descendant, a descendant of Cain who is also guilty of murder. His name is Lamech. Shortly after that, we see that sin and crime becomes rampant. It becomes so bad that God floods the world. That's only in the sixth chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 6. And then after that, once, uh, once God has saved Noah and his family, we see that verse that we read in the beginning. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. And here we see how much God hates murder to the point that whoever murders is, deser is deserving of death. And this is where we get the concept of the death penalty. The death penalty is not a made-up concept. It doesn't come from America. It doesn't come from Europe. It doesn't come from any other country or nation. It comes from God himself. It is what he instituted as a punishment for murder. If we want to see it a little bit deeper, we go to Numbers chapter 35, and it says, Moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. Right on top of that, it says that if anybody tries to make a ransom to try to save that murderer who is guilty, God says, don't take that ransom. Don't try to have them pay it off. Don't let them go. But he says that murderer who is guilty shall surely be put to death. So what I want you to take away from this is that one, yes, God hates murder. He absolutely hates it. It is a violation to not only his command, but his creation. And what I also want you to understand is that, that uh, from this, and this is kind of a little bit of a side note, but I think it's very important, um, is that this is the foundation or the basis that we have for capital punishment. And I think sometimes us as Christians, we view the death penalty or capital punishment as a foreign thing but it is instituted by God. It is his standard for punishment for murderers. It was instituted back then, and it continues even now today. Nothing has changed. Whenever a government uh, executes a, 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 the death penalty, it is not a wrong or unlawful thing. If you remember last week when Keith was going over... Um, the fifth commandment, he went into Romans chapter 13, and there it talks about the authorities. And I want you to see how it speaks about the government. And it says, Paul says, the government, right? For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. And look carefully. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. Meaning, it doesn't kill for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So I thought that was interesting. So I wanted to share that with you guys, um, just so you keep that in mind. But what I do want you to understand before we move forward is that murder is wrong, not only because God says so, but because it is a violation to the Imago Dei, that we were created in his image now when we look at that sixth commandment you shall not murder i think a lot of us are like well yeah that's obvious right we shall not murder but it is packed with implications and maybe we can't draw those implications directly from that sixth commandment itself from exodus chapter 20 verse 13 um, but we can get it from all of scripture there is several several references to the sixth commandment all over scripture so what i wanted to do tonight is look at some of those implications and it's through a little i guess um a little series of questions called does the sixth commandment condone or condemn blank and i have a few for you guys 
Um, and then I guess we can go into uh, a few other ones when we get to our discussion time. But there are so many that we can do on this. But the very first one that I want to look at is self-defense. Does the Sixth Commandment condemn or condone it? And when I mean self-defense, I'm not talking about, um, I guess, defending yourself from somebody trying to, you know, hit you or defending yourself from somebody who is angry at you and just is cussing at you. But I'm talking about self-defense um, in a way where it's life-threatening and you have to respond in a way where you may have to kill another individual. Does the Sixth Commandment condemn or condone that type of self-defense? And there is a lot of debate when it comes to this. Um, and usually people who are against this type of self-defense, they go to this passage. And I know a lot of you guys are aware of this passage where Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Right? I think a lot of us are familiar with that. That if somebody hits us on the right cheek, we offer up the, we turn the other cheek. Let them hit that one too. And um, what people have done with this passage is they have begun to uh, become like an extreme type of pacifist where no matter what happens, they're just going to allow another person to inflict violence onto them. And I believe that is wrong. Jeff Durbin I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He does. He does. Uh, he, he's done several uh, things concerning self-defense, and, and and he has um, several videos on this. And I think they're very good. And he was going on explaining that in the Hebrew culture, right, everything was done with the right hand. So when we look at this passage here, and we see that it says, "But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, right, which is this one right here." The way that was done in the Hebrew culture was with, obviously with the right hand, but it was a backhanded type of slap. It was an insult, a slap that was meant to insult somewhat, someone, to degrade someone. And in this context, it doesn't have to be a physical slap, um, but it is really just any type of offense or insult done to you. And I think that's, that's, that can apply as well to our culture because um, right, we can say things as, as like, oh, this person did this to me and that was, a, that was like a slap in the face, right? That was like an insult to me. So what this passage is, uh, is telling us is that if someone insults us, right, if they do wrong, what we do is we do turn the other cheek. And in this way, we are pacifists. But the problem that we have and the problem that Jesus is addressing is that we are prideful human beings. And the moment that someone insults us, what we want to do is fire back. When someone says something nasty to us, we want to say something nasty back. When someone shoves us, we want to shove back even harder, right? We just want to do what's equally wrong or sometimes even worse to that person. So what do we do with this passage? And... If this, when it's about a life-threatening scenario, what do we do in the occasion that someone wants to inflict serious, serious damage, not only to you, but to your family as well? What happens? And, and, and what I want to use as a basis to my answer is found in Exodus chapter 22. In Exodus chapter 22, it says, if the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. He shall surely make restitution. If he owns nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. What this is saying is that if there's a thief that breaks into somebody's home, let's say at nighttime, and that thief dies because the homeowner was, um, was defending his home and his family, then there is, there, there is no punishment for the homeowner. But it does change if it is during the daytime. So what, what we can understand from this is that killing for self-defense should never be the first answer. 
Now, why would it say at nighttime it's okay, but in the daytime it's not? And what we can, what the assumption that we can make is because at nighttime, right, it is a, it catches, it catches the homeowner and their family by surprise. And maybe that homeowner responds as, as a reaction with, um, with, with, with a lethal hit or a lethal, um, uh, I guess, type of self-defense towards that, that thief. But I think that the, the biggest thing we can take away from this and one of the mistakes that a lot of people who are, are, are pro, you know, yes, like we, the Bible supports self-defense and you can kill in the, in the occasion that you and your family are um, in danger. I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people make in that is that they want to make that their first response. That the moment that someone steps onto their property, they want to shoot them. And I think that's the most unchristlike and unbiblical type of response. What we should get from this is that killing should always be the very, very, very last option. We should have a pacifistic attitude, not an extreme pacifistic attitude where we never do anything, but we should have a pacifistic attitude to always um, be at peace and never, never want to, um, I guess, look for killing as the first answer. It should always be the last. And we can come back to that in discussion. But the next one that I want to go into, um, and as actually the next ones, are a little bit more sensitive. And whenever I say the things that I do, please understand, I say it with grace. And understand that the people who have committed these sins, there is forgiveness for these people. But the next one we're going into is abortion. Does the Sixth Commandment condemn or condone abortion? And, and right, this is a, this is a very, um, I, even this one is a very highly debated one, even amongst some Christians, which I think is, is crazy. And I, I wanted to share a stat with you guys. Ever since Roe v. Wade in 1973, there has been almost 65 million abortions. And I, I won't even leave this for the conclusion. I'll say it at the very beginning. Um, abortion is murder. It is the unjust killing of a baby. And most of the time, the, the abortion debate um, lies on whether or not the baby inside the womb is actually a baby, a human being, or just a clump of cells. And maybe you guys have seen videos and clips online, but that's usually where people go to. They'll say, oh, it's just a clump of cells. That's all that it is. Well, I believe the Bible differs. I believe that science differs. Human life begins at conception. When the mother's egg and the father's sperm come together, they combine and create a new string of DNA that is personalized and completely unique. And I want you to see a few Bible verses. In Psalm chapter 139, it says, For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. We go down to verse 16, and it says, Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. And what we can see here is that God has planned out and ordained the days of David before, not, not even when he was in the womb, but before he was even in the womb. Before his parents even had a thought about, about David. Before he, his parents even existed. Before the foundations of the world. We can look at Luke chapter 1 here we have the um, in Luke chapter 1 it talks to us about John the Baptist and his parents and it says when Elizabeth heard that's John the Baptist's mother when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and, and I think this one here is interesting right because it says that word the baby which was in the womb and if we look at the Greek word, that word 
is brephos and it means an unborn or newborn child. That, that same Greek word is used interchangeably, whether speaking about a baby that's in the womb or a baby that was just born. So the difference between a fetus and, uh, and any one of us is just this, age, location, and level of dependence. There is no difference between a baby who is nine months in the womb and the baby that is one day old. There is no difference. And, and sometimes ministers of the word of God make a mistake. And what they try to do is, um, let, let me give you guys an example. There will be somebody who will begin to ask the question, well, I understand that abortion is wrong, but what about under these circumstances? What if my life is at risk? What if, what if this baby, this pregnancy is a result of rape? What about then? Can abortion be okay then? And the answer is that abortion is never okay. It is never wrong. And if you think otherwise, look back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. It is a violation to the Imago Dei, what God has created in His own image. And if anybody has committed this, this sin, of course, there is forgiveness. I, I think sometimes, too, maybe Christians make the mistake and just completely bash and bash on people who, who have had an abortion. And yes, it is wrong. And yes, it is evil. And yes, it is murder. But yes, just like any other sin, there is forgiveness for this sin. And if you guys want to bring this up during discussion, you definitely can. But the next one that we have is another one that's sensitive. And that is suicide. Does the sixth commandment condemn or condone it? And to answer this question, we must understand what suicide is. And suicide is the intentional and voluntary taking away of one's life. This includes all forms of assisted suicide also. If you didn't know that was a thing, it is a thing. There is assisted suicide, which is known as a, um, oh, they have a nickname for it, I can't remember. But um, assisted suicide is a thing. And it's offered to people who have some type of terminal disease or sickness to where they can just end their pain and suffering. And my answer to, to, the, to this question is that the Sixth Commandment condemns suicide. It is the taking away of a life, a life that was created in the image of God. Ephesians, uh, not Ephesians, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 8 tells us that no, that no one has power over the day of their death. This means that no one has authority over the day of their death. And when someone commits suicide and takes away their own life, what they are doing is they are placing themselves in the position of God, which is wrong. God gives life, and He is the one who takes away life. No human being has the authority to do so. Now, Another mistake that a lot of Christians make is that they say that suicide is the unforgivable sin. And to that, I say it's completely wrong, completely false. That is not what the unforgivable sin is. And, and people say, well, anyone who commits suicide goes directly to hell. Why? Because they can't repent of their sins. And if you believe that's how salvation works you have a wrong view of salvation that is not how salvation works because i promise you this every single person that has died every single christian that has died has sins 
that they never, ever brought up to the Lord. Sins that they forgot about. So why is this one any different? Is it wrong? Absolutely, it is wrong. It is a violation to the sixth commandment, but it is not the unforgivable sin. And I want you to understand that. Whenever a person is saved, they are completely saved of all past, present, and future sins. Can a Christian commit suicide? It is possible. They should not do it. It should not be a thing. It should not be even something that they should consider. But it can happen. Solomon said he hated his life. Elijah wanted to die. Job wanted to die. There is a lot of suffering. There is a lot of pain. Paul endured many hardships. Christ was known as a man full of sorrows and countless of Christians throughout all all these hundreds and hundreds of years have endured suffering and pain and depression. So yes, Christians do suffer. Christians at times don't want to continue living. But suicide should never be the answer. Why? Because it is a sin. It is a violation of the sixth commandment. And understand that it is not the unforgivable sin. But it is a sin. Now, when we're thinking about the sixth commandment and the things that we touched up on right now, um, most people will say, well, I've never even broken the sixth commandment. I'm still alive. I've never had an abortion. I've never killed anybody else. And they'll say, that's, I'm, I'm, free. I'm, not, I'm not guilty towards the sixth commandment. I've never done any of those things. And I would say, well, Jesus would completely disagree with you. He would disagree. In the Sermon on the Mount, um, if you guys remember, you guys were here with us during that series. What Jesus does is he begins to mention uh, sins, right? Uh, not sins, uh, commandments from the Old Testament. And he says, he mentions a commandment and then he says, but I say to you. And what he's doing there is not making new commandments, but he's fully preaching the old ones. And what he's saying is that it's not enough to obey the letter of the law. And that's what a lot of people do. They'll say, do not kill. Okay, I haven't done that. But what we have done is we have uh, broken the spiritual sense of that sixth commandment. And what we must do is conform to the spirit of the law also. Uh, that is our duty. So when we read Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, and by the way, Keith covered this and he did a, an excellent job. So you want to check it out. Um, Keith, I'll, I'll show you up here. This is, uh, it's on here. You guys can look it up. It's on our channel, Sermon on the Mount. Part 11. Um, but anyways, we'll go back to this. Um, and Jesus says, you have heard the, ancient, the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And I, for, sake, for time's sake, I can't uh, dive too deep into this. But what we can understand from this passage is, is that murder does not begin with the action of murder itself. Murder does not begin with me picking up a weapon. Murder does not begin with me pulling the trigger. Murder begins in the heart. It begins with anger. And if we remember, not all types of anger are, are wrong. There is righteous anger, of course, but that is not what we're referring to. We're referring to the type of anger that one has, an unjust type of anger, an anger without good reasoning towards another individual. If we look at 1 John chapter 3, and if you guys remember when we went through that, um, 1 John chapter 3, oh, give me one second. it says this, For everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you, don't, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
right? Here, the, the uh, John says that anyone who hates his brother, what he's saying is not only are they uh, breaking God's commandment, not only are they breaking the sixth commandment, but he's saying that these people aren't even saved. The people who are harboring, harboring hatred towards a brother are murderers themselves. So when we think about the commandments of God, when we think about the sixth commandment, we need to think about our heart posture. Why? Because does God look at the outward appearance? He looks at the heart, at the inward being. That is what God looks at. And what I want to do now is I, I found this really edifying. It, it is a catechism and it has three questions in reference to the sixth commandment and answers to these questions. And I thought it was just wonderfully said. And it's from the Heidelberg Catechism. And that first question says, what doth God require in the sixth commandment? And it says that neither in thoughts, nor words, nor gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonor, hate, wound, or kill my neighbor by myself or by another, but that I lay aside all desire of revenge. Also, that I hurt not myself, nor willfully expose myself to any danger. Wherefore also the magistrate is armed with the sword to prevent murder. Right? And although we don't hold to any of these, um, any of these confessions, I like to look at them. And I think a lot of the times they do really, really good jobs. Uh, a really good job at um, being able to define some of the questions that we may have. And I think they do an excellent job when it comes to the sixth commandment. And what's so important here is that very first part that it, where it says that neither in thoughts, not only in deeds, but neither in thoughts, words, or gestures that we may not, that we may not dishonor or hate or wound or kill our neighbor. And we go to the next question and it says, but this commandment seems only to speak of murder. And then it says, in forbidding murder, God teaches us that he abhor abhors the causes thereof, such as envy, hatred, anger, and the desire of revenge. And that he accounts all these as murder. God hates all things that lead to murder. And there he names the sins. He, I'm talking about the confession. The confession names the sins. And those sins are envy. They're hatred. They are anger and the desire of revenge. And it says that God views these sins as murder. Why? Because this is the root cause of murder. Again, it doesn't begin with me picking up a weapon. That is the very last phase of murder. Murder starts at the heart, at the inward being of an individual. And the last question that I want us to focus on is this one. But is it enough that we do not kill any man in the manner mentioned above? In other words, it's saying, is it just okay for me not to just, to not envy other people, to not have hatred towards other people, to not um, take revenge? Is that, is it okay for for me to just not do any of those. Am I good there? And then the answer is no. For when God forbids envy, hatred, and anger, He commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to show patience, peace, meekness, mercy, and all kindness towards Him and prevent His hurt as much as in us lies and that we do good even to our enemies. So what I want us to take away from this sixth commandment is that it's not enough to not just to not break it. That's not enough. But rather we must do the opposite. When God says do not kill, what we should do is love our neighbor. What we should do is show patience to our neighbor. 
show peace to our neighbor. We should be meek. We should be merciful people and be kind to all people. And that should be the attitude that we have as Christians when it comes to the sixth commandment. The same attitude that God had for us, that we were worthy of eternal death. And although we deserve it, he did spare us from that. He spared us from eternal death. And he didn't just leave us at a neutral place, although he could have. And instead of leaving us in a neutral space, he gives us eternal life. Do you see that? We were deserving of death, eternal death for, for our sins. And he could have brought us in, into this neutral space and just left us there. Not heaven, not hell. And he could have just left us there. But on top of that, he gives us eternal life where we can spend eternity with God himself. And this is only possible because of the life and death of Jesus Christ, the perfect one. And that should be our motivation to treating even the individual who mistreats us, even the individual who deserves, who doesn't deserve any of our patience or peace or meekness or mercy or kindness. We should still show it. And I want to take you to Romans chapter 12 to finish off. And I think a lot of us are familiar with Romans chapter 12. And here Paul says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. And then we go down, we skip down to verse 17 through 19. And then he says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. No revenge. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And I think that's beautiful here. Paul here is laying the responsibility onto us. He's saying if it is possible and it depends on you, it is your duty, Christian, to be at peace with everyone. Verse 19 Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is the motivation that we should have as Christians when it comes to the sixth commandment. That if our enemy is in need, what we do is we show kindness and love even if they don't deserve it. And that very last verse, I think it's beautiful. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that is the attitude that we should have as Christians. Glory be to God. Amen.